one of the motivations for me writing the book was in fact uh, to, to understand my father better too. And he was a, uh, a very smart, funny, angry, fearful, stoic, uh, generous, exasperating person. Uh, and he was also an autodidact. He was self-taught. He, um, he had the, what turned out to be the, uh, the mixed blessing of getting tuberculosis in his late 20s and he spent almost four years in a TB ward in San Francisco, the public ward there. And uh, that, was, that was a moment that changed his life and made him a persistent and deep reader for the rest of his life, which was passed along to me. And I have to imagine that it made me a, a writer, too. So I'm going to read something that, um, that moves in and out of, of factuality. Um, that's filled with truthiness, uh, as Stephen Colbert says, and uh, about being in the TB war. And I've enjoyed reading this part in libraries because it's about a library. As the months passed, Dad began to read, distinguishing himself from his brother, who never read anything before the war except the racing form, and then later maybe a Zane Gray or Mickey Spillane that he'd find aboard ship. The hospital maintained a, a library of 2,000 volumes. Once a week, he made his way down the winding, flat white corridor, up a, up a flight of stairs, and into the anteroom that housed a collection reserved exclusively for residents of the tuberculosis ward. He vowed to read every book in that room if he did not get better soon or die first. During his first three and a half years of removal from the world, he read most of Mark Twain's books, Superman comics, and copies of the Daily Workers smuggled into the hospital by members of the maintenance staff who were eventually dismissed for their enterprise. For the first time in his life, my father couldn't work, doctor's orders. He could only rest, he could read. He read Charles Dickens' ghost stories and our mutual friend, and then Francis Parkman, The Old Testament, Sinclair Lewis, Lewis Carroll, and Les Miserables. My father read omnivorously, ferociously, in the country of the white death, the phrase the jockey, also a resident in the ward, had taken from the Spaniards to describe the fluttering bedsheet finality of tuberculosis in this waiting room for the worst that would happen. His incapacity meant opportunity. There are always books in his hands now, rather than dirty old tools. My father sped through Darwin's account of the voyage of the Beagle. He absorbed H.G. Wells and Jules Verne, and occasionally he pondered what the future would look like tomorrow after tomorrow after tomorrow. He introduced himself to contrasting visions of a republic as propounded by Thomas Jefferson and James Thurber. He read the illustrated biographies of Tecumseh, Crazy Horse, and Geronimo. He pursued the lurching pothole trail of the self-taught, never quite confident about what he should master. Years later, he would quote Othello to the mailman and recite long passages of Cyrano de Bergerac, mocking the neighbors who had never heard of Baku or of Samarkand. Halfway into his third year, my father stumbled into the most important book of his long stay. The Star Rover by Jack London chronicled the exploits of a Swede from Minnesota, presently a San Quentin convict. In the novel, the Swede learned through rigorous self-discipline to induce a trance that could send his mind sprawling from the lockdown of solitary confinement into a universe of previous incarnations. In the privacy of his cell, the prisoner relived past lifetimes as a medieval court gesture, monk, Elizabethan soldier, shipwrecked sailor, Viking mercenary, lawgiver, judge. My father read the book as simple truth. He had himself experienced a sudden transformation from his own cell of sickness into other lives, this new world of books. Dad thought about Achilles. He had encountered the ancient Greek hero in an illustrated volume by Bullfinch, then stumbled upon him again nearly two years later in Homer's Odyssey. Achilles was dead and reigning over Hades, a shade of his previous existence. If he were only alive today, he told a visitor to the underworld, he would happily forego all his past glories. There is nothing like life, Achilles proclaimed, prisoner of the gray light of the dead. Achilles made my father think of simple things, wet grass mashed under bare feet, he could feel its knife edges prickly and cool, even though he hadn't run across a lawn or walked through a field in three years. The sound of rain on a river, a cold beer drawn from the tap in a smoky tavern with a jukebox blaring and people dancing. He knew he was going to die. 
After three years, almost nobody got better. The doctors agreed that he showed no signs of improvement. Some weeks, the cough grew worse, his joints pained again. All he could do was sleep. Still, remember Achilles. Even this was better than death. The thing was to be alive, then something was possible. Achilles was nothing, air and reputation. He wanted to live. In his third year, my father began to imagine himself getting better every day. He didn't daydream about a miraculous recovery, but like the prisoner in the Jack London novel, he applied the possibility of a new life to himself, a regimen of maintenance and repair. He invented in these moments of absolute fabulous concentration an existence beyond his cell. He ordered his mind's eye to envision his lungs clearing, his body growing stronger. He had been right all along. They couldn't cure you. They really couldn't. You had to do it yourself. Some days he could only work up the energy for five or ten minutes of willpower. He did whatever he could. There is nothing like life. In three months, performing on cue for the nurse, Franklin could expand his lungs like rubber bags and they didn't hurt. He didn't cough. The doctor told him he was very surprised, very pleased. Franklin now tested negative. There are no miracles, my father decided. But there is the miraculous triumph of a man determined to survive, which he can do if he's willing to make an instrument of his own mind and commit himself to the job. Without self-discipline, a man didn't have a chance. You worked hard all day, and then the next day you got up and you did it all over again. Uh, my father actually told me that story of, of the, the Jack London novel. It made me think, told it to me once when I was in my 30s that I'd had a, a kind of bad injury that I was recovering from and, and having a lot of trouble with it, a lot of pain. And of course I knew about his time in the hospital, but uh, on the phone one day he told me the story about reading this novel and then imagining his lungs clearing. And he never repeated the story, and it made me think about how some of the stories that are most important to us, we tell once or twice. We're selective about it. And the ones that we do air, we, we know instinctively that they're going to change. You know, once you, you let them out of the bag and they have a life of their own. And I think he, was, that he knew something about that, you know, that it was, it was too valuable to trivialize. You know, I'm going I'm to give it to you today because I know you're in a lot of pain and you need it. You be careful what you do about it. But you know, now I've let it out of the bag and it's, it's what it is.